I'd like to call to order the uh, Wednesday, September 4th, uh, Dr. Cog board work session. Um, roll, roll call, Connie. Roll call. Roll call. Eva Henry. Steve Butteries here. here. Eva's here. Hi, Eva. Jeff Baker. Here. Elise Jones. Jeff Gardner. Andy Wheelock. George Marlin. Kevin Flynn. Here. Roger Partridge. Ron Angles. Oh. Hi. Bob Pfeiffer. Here. Bob Roth. Here. Mary Vidham. David Spellman. Aaron Brockett. Here. Margo Ramsden. Ben Baca. Matt Johnston. Roger Hudson. Ben Price. George Teal. Tammy Maurer. Here. Jeremy Fay, Russell Stewart, Bill Christie, Becky Thomas, Olson, Bill Gibbs, Laura Brown, from Gore. Walton. Hello. Danny Goodwine. Jacob LeBure. Isaac Levy. Karina Elrod. Kyle Schlachter. Larry Strock. Jacob Lofgren. Wynn Shaw. John Peck. Marsha Martin. Ashley Stolzman. Bonnie Sullivan. Barney Drystadt. Joyce Palazuski. Colleen Whitlow, Paul Sutton, Sean Foray, Chris Larson, Julie Mullica, Joyce Downing, Kelly Daigle, Dave Black, Sandy Hammerley, Jessica Sandgren, Jackie Phillips, Herb Atchison, yes. Bud Starker, Adam Zarin, Rebecca White, Paul Van Meter. Here. Um. John, before you go, um, sorry. I know we haven't had a work session in a while, so just remember that um, if you do have a comment or questions, to, to please use the microphones because we do have several that are on, on WebEx this, uh, this evening. Thank you. Uh, the next item is the summary of the March 6, 2019 board work session. That's in your packet. Any changes, please uh, let us know. Uh, next item, public comment. The chair requests that there are no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has board of directors. So I guess any public comment? All right, next item, uh, briefing on Fast Track's initial unfinished corridors report, Mr. Genova. Oh, fan too, I'm sorry. Good afternoon, uh, Matthew Helfand, Senior Transportation Planner here at Dr. Cog. Um, RTD has completed about three quarters of their fast tracks program, including seven corridors and the redevelopment of Denver Union Station. Uh, in addition, the first segment of North Metro is anticipated to open to the public next year. Uh, RTD's board recently directed their staff to report on unfinished fast tracks corridors and we have uh, RTD general manager Dave Genova here to brief you on the report. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, thank you uh, Dr. Cog for having RTD in tonight for the invitation to present on a, on a couple items. We're, we're pleased to be here. So uh, the first report out tonight is going to be on our staff draft initial report. Uh, that we provided to our board of directors uh, of now has probably been a couple of months ago now. And it is the result of the board resolution on finishing fast tracks and the Northwest Peak Service Plan that our board uh, adopted, I believe, in April. And so this is, I think, the second resolution that the board has adopted in terms of completing, uh, showing their commitment to completing uh, fast tracks. So a couple important things on this board 
on this board resolution, it directed the RTD staff uh, to look at all kinds of different ways that we could uh, uh, identify to outline proposed steps to move forward on the unfinished corridors. And I'll, I'll go through those a, a little bit later so we, we have all the detail on there. And to outline proposed steps to move forward on the Northwest Rail uh, Peak Service Plan. It asked the staff to report back to the board within 60 days. Uh, and we did, that was a tight time frame, and that's why we call it a draft initial report. It's uh, in, in no terms a final report, and it is uh, meant to be the beginning of an iterative process with our board of directors and stakeholders uh, regarding possibilities for the advancement of the unfinished corridor. So I, I wanna make a couple important distinctions. You probably saw it in the, in the packet, but uh, the report does not contain recommendations uh, or suggestions for the board. It's merely uh, a, a variety of different kinds of possibilities uh, that then we can discuss with the board and with uh, stakeholders uh, regarding the uh, unfinished uh, projects. So some uh, assumptions made in the, in the funding, and I'll, I'll talk about the three scenarios uh, in a moment, but they're all based on our most recent sales and use tax forecast that was provided by CU Lead School of Business, so that was in March of 19. And we receive, I believe, three forecasts from uh, the CU Lead School of Business uh, every year. And we use those forecasts to do our annual budget, our six-year uh, midterm financial plan budget, and then, of course, our long-range uh, financial plan. So as those forecasts change, um, which uh, just this year, the, the last forecast that we received from CU uh, Lead School of Business caused us to do a $49 million reduction in the 2019 budget. Uh, just based on a forecast between a uh, difference of, of four uh, months. Uh, the forecasts, they're all in the, in the Fast Tracks financial plan. And then the scenarios that, that I want to uh, talk about, they're subject to change with the board adoption of our midterm financial plan, uh, which the board will be seeing in the, or probably up for not just seeing, we've been working on it for a number of months, uh, but they should be approving it here in the next uh, month or two. And then also our long range plan, which is now gonna be a 2050 a horizon and then our 2020 budget. So we're in those cycles of uh, various milestones within those right now. And of course, all scenarios are in year of expenditure uh, dollars. So a few observations before I get into the, in, into the scenario. So we had a lot of questions about uh, our base system. So we divide everything in our program when we talk about uh, revenues and expenditures, and particularly when we talk about the 1% sales tax that we receive, six tenths is for the base system. Four tenths is for fast tracks. The four tenths can only be spent on fast tracks capital and fast tracks O and M. But we've had a variety of questions from board members about the ability to use base funds to help support the fast track system. And specifically, uh, a couple of questions that we had was, are there any funds available now to support uh, the unfinished corridors? And there, there are no base system funds. Uh, and are there any base system funds available that we could loan to fast tracks and then pay it back? And uh, the answer is that at currently, with the current financial situation, there, there, is, there is not. Another important thing to note is that we really don't have any capacity to support any increase to, well, any significant increase to our base uh, bus and rail system at, at this point in time, according to our current uh, financial plan. So regarding the fast tracks investment, a little, a little background first. We're approximately 70 to 75% complete when we look at the entire fast tracks program. Uh, seven transit corridors have opened. We'll open one in 2020. And then of course the redevelopment of Denver Union Station was part of the fast tracks investment. The original budget was about 4.7 billion when we put the plan out for review. And we've actually invested a little bit more than $5.6 billion and of course, I think many of you are familiar with some of the challenges we had along the way. Uh, the biggest one being a huge loss in revenue due, due to the recession. You know, we, we estimate about a billion dollars of revenue that we lost during that recessionary period. And then of course, at the same time, we were seeing higher construction and materials costs. So uh, aligning for unfortunately not a good situation for us. In 2013, we established the Fa Fast Tracks internal savings account or what we call the FISA. And we, what we do with this account is we've tried to identify a variety of, uh, of revenues that we can put into that account. And it's, it's literally that, a savings account for use on fast track. So that could be used for, uh, the board was clear in that resolution, it could be used for capital and it can also be used for operations and maintenance uh, on, uh, on fast tracks. 
So just a quick snapshot of the unfinished corridors. I think many of you are familiar with these. Uh, the central rail extension, a little less than a, a one mile extension. And you can see here the costs for capital construction and the annual O&M. Uh, so I, I won't go through those, those numbers individually as you can see them on the screen. Uh, the North Metro completion, which would be the last six miles of what we now call the end line, which will be opening uh, next year. Uh, the Northwest Rail, uh, and then we've divided that into two programs, the peak service plan, uh, which has its capital estimate and its operating annual operating estimate, and then of course the full service for the Northwest Rail, and that's uh, the remainder of the B-Line, the, by far the biggest, uh, the biggest project we have at a little over 1.5 billion in, in capital. And then the Southwest uh, light rail extension, which is a short uh, light rail extension that'll uh, connect uh, our station in the furthest south at Mineral and bring it down into Highlands Ranch. So just for consideration, and again, these are simply scenarios. They're, um, they're ideas, uh, they're possibilities. Uh, I don't uh, want anybody to read. So some of the scenarios have different kinds of prioritization. Some of them look at, uh, let's start with how do we get the most done as quickly as we can, and some of them start with uh, Northwest Rail or, or Northwest Peak Service. It's just so people, the people, uh, our stakeholders and our board members can get a, a, and a variety of different ideas uh, around sequencing. So the three concepts that we modeled uh, in the report was no new bonding authority or funding. The second one was a Tabor election, so to give us uh, additional bonding authority but no new revenue. And then the third funding scenario is both a Tabor election with bonding and sales and use tax increase, and we'll run through those. Uh, the first one, no new bonding authority or funding. Uh, we'd use certificates of participation to fund uh, replacements of vehicles. And in scenario 1A, we have uh, some dates in here. We, we ran uh, in this particular scenario, the unfinished corridor starting with the least expensive corridor first in order to accelerate as many projects as possible. If we do that in that order, it would be central corridor in about 2039, southwest in 2040, the remainder of North Metro in 2041 does not finish the Northwest Route Peak Service Plan or the full service plan before the 2050 horizon. Scenario 1B flips that uh, sequencing, doing the Northwest Route Peak Service first would be 2042, and then no other corridor would be complete by 2050 horizon. And scenario two, uh, which again is just for additional bonding, and this election would be held prior to 2032 uh, to authorize additional bonding. Authority, and we would use certificates of replacement for replacement of vehicles. Uh, the rationale behind 2032 is that's when we would have the ability to, for two things, the debt capacity to take on more debt with our debt coverage ratio, and then secondly, the ability to have the cash flow to pay off that additional bonding. So scenario 2A says let's look at the uh, unfinished corridors, again, with least expensive first. Uh, again, a Central 2037, Southwest 2038, North Metro 2039, Northwest Peak uh, in 48 does not finish the service plan uh, by the, the, the full Northwest service plan by the 2050 horizon. So you see it's a little bit better uh, than scenario one, but um, not a whole lot. Uh, additional bonding, scenario 2B looks at completing Northwest Route Peak service first in 2042, and then the other corridors by 2049, and you can see the breakout there. And then scenario 2C tests the capacity to finish the complete Northwest Rail Service Plan, and we can do that by 2046, but does not finish any of the other unfinished corridors by the 2050 horizon. So concept three is where we can really advance things along. And in concept three, uh, what we modeled was looking at a Tabor election with bonding capacity and a sales tax increase. And we did a couple scenarios here. Uh, the idea behind the timing would be uh, 2021 in this, in this scenario to go for this authority. In this one, all scenarios finish all unfinished corridors by 2040. In 3A, we assume a 0.1% sales and use tax increase. Uh, the Northwest Rail Peak Service Plan sequence first by 2026. The last corridor would be the full Northwest Rail full service by 2039, but you could see the remainder are all done uh, before 2035. In scenario 3B, we assume a 0.1% sales and use tax, and we sequence the corridors with the least expensive first, finishing the Northwest Rail full service, full service plan by 2032. And we would, in this scenario, we looked at completing the full plan, so we didn't look at including the Northwest Rail uh, peak service. Uh, 
In 3C, we look at a 0.1% sales and use tax increase in issuing more bonds with more debt. A uh, little bit of a different scenario, uh, it completes the Northwest Peak Service first by 2026. The last quarter would be full Northwest Rail by 2037 and all the other ones by 2030. And then scenario 3D is even a little bit different, assuming a 0.15% sales and use tax increase, sequencing corridors with least expensive first, finishing the Northwest Rail full service by 2032. Uh, and the interesting thing about a 0.15 or the scenario 3D and also the next scenario 3E is these scenarios not only complete the unfinished corridors uh, uh, predominantly within about a decade of the, uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the initiative, but also allow us to be able to expand and support the base system as well. Uh, scenario 3E is a little bit less, a 0.1% sales tax, but with a three-year delay to build up some cash value and some bonding capability, and then sequencing some corridors uh, similarly with uh, least, uh, least expensive first, finishing full Northwest Rail Service by 2035. And again, that supports the base system as well. So that's probably most of the... Uh, I think fairly interesting parts or really the meat of the report. What we've done the, for the remainder of it is just kind of really just identify other kinds of funding scenarios and opportunities that are worth exploring. We haven't, we've simply identified these. We haven't really looked into any of these in any kind of a detail because our board asked us to look at what opportunities could they be. Federal new starts and small start grants. Uh, we have a report on a couple of years ago, I believe in 2016 maybe, Looking to Bill Van Meter, he's nodding his head yes. We did an analysis of the four unfinished corridors in terms of how they might compete for federal funding. So that is part of the uh, part of the report. Uh, of course, TIFIA, RIF, private activity bonds, some of the things we've, we've already done. Stakeholder cash, loan, private equity contributions, tolled roadway, uh, VMT tax, parking charges, fees on other transportation modes and delivery methods such as other kinds of uh, services such as transportation network companies, um, fees for access to uh, trip data, uh, property tax, special assessment district, and uh, the list kind of goes on uh, on a few other different things, including development impact fees, uh, state level transit and rail funds, which we don't receive any of now. Uh, and then just being uh, creative with trying to get some more value capture in and around uh, RTD owned uh, facilities. So again, I just want to stress that this is really uh, about possibilities. It's not recommendations. It's not suggestions. It's not final. Uh, we've had several discussions with the board. The original presentation of this, uh, I believe, was in about mid-June. And then so in your packet, you have the presentation, but then you have a series of questions and answers that were generated uh, predominantly by our board of directors that we came back an, a number of weeks later and, and walked through with them. So. Uh, I'm happy to take questions at this point, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, any questions here or on the on the phone? Director Partridge. Is Lynette Kelsey? Oh, sorry. We'll, we'll go with Director Partridge first, and then okay. Ms. Kelsey next. Is it on? You never know. This is on or off. Does it go? The red light goes on and off. Thank you, David, for a great presentation, and, and uh, certainly understand the challenges with financing. I think we all all see that every day. So, with all the scenarios you presented, did you look at completing those scenarios with just a fare box increase? Uh, no, we did not uh, look at that scenario. It's something that we could. I would say my uh, initial reaction on that is it'd be interesting to look at that to see um, how incremental of an increase we would need to, to really make a, make a significant difference. And so uh, with FAIR revenue now, I know that the considerations of our board is they, we look at FAIR, we look at our FAIR rates every three years. That's the current board policy. Uh, the, the board is very attuned right now about uh, any additional future raises, although in our midterm financial plan that's under consideration by our board right now, we do assume at year three and at year six that we would have about a nine or ten percent uh, increase. But so that's a pretty significant increase in fare, and that's that's just enough to keep up with day-to-day -day operations and maintenance. Uh, Director Kelsey on the phone. Thank you, Chair. 
Um, I was wondering if all of your projections were run with um, the models with any contingencies for overrun delays, or is this if everything just goes perfectly smoothly? I, I think I heard that question pretty well. I'll try to repeat it. Where did, did the models consider any contingencies, uh, overruns, or any other uh, concerns or issues uh, on the projects? And uh, I, I, I would say that we, you know, we, we didn't. We just looked at pretty basic uh, scenario running uh, for now. And, and I will tell you that an, another thing that we did look at a little bit was the ability around the, uh, the practicality of delivering this number of projects in a short period of time and the feasibility of having the, uh, the design, the engineering, and the construction resources available to do that. So really, uh, we, we didn't look at the human resource component and then also the human resource component to do the operations and maintenance, right? And I think everyone's fairly familiar that we do have a pretty significant shortage on operators now. Um, so we, uh, we simply really just looked at the basic financial models and scenarios. Okay, thank you. Director Jones. So thanks, Dave, for this um, report and, and presentation and also just being responsive to um, the corridors that are part of the Unfinished Fast Tracks group. Um, several of us hail from the Northwest Corridor, as you know, and so yeah, the report has appreciated the honesty of it. It's very sobering um, to look at the delivery dates for Northwest Rail, as you know. Um, I'm curious uh, about the final scenarios. So you're talking about going back to the ballot, which we know will be would be a politically um, challenging thing to do. But nonetheless, y y you talk about the date of 2021. I assume that's because that's at the end of your visioning process, it's also an odd year election with lower turnout by far than typically even years elections. So I'm just curious about your thinking on putting that out there as a trial balloon. As far as, uh, as, far as this report and when we looked at the 2021, it was, it was really just determining when was the soonest that we, that we could possibly go, that we, would, that we would feel somewhat comfortable in having uh, a good degree of supporting documentation available to develop uh, confidence that uh, this is this is doable, right? And so, and I think that we're limited to going for uh, a sales tax increase vote only in odd years. Director Atchison, get your question answered. Well, well, there was a second half, and oh, I'm sorry uh, on the the reimagine RTD, which is the next presentation, right? So this was, this report was done really before we were formulating through that plan. And so while that timing might kind of line up with this, uh, this one was the, the reason we had 2021 is we thought that was our earliest opportunity to be able to do it. Director Atchison. Thanks. Uh, Dave, can you kind of, in the back of your mind, we had this presentation very similar to this, but your CFO was at the last NATO board meeting. And one of the questions I ask, and I don't know how you're going to resolve this, um, you have a new system that you're instituting across the process of being able to count boardings, and whether it's on bus or rail. But the question I had is because there's such a diversity among the rates that different people are getting on pay, how do we know the ones who are actually paying versus those who are free? Because if they're, if they're paying, then they're putting something into the till. If they're not, they're not. So how do we understand what rate payers who are using transportation are really doing? Because that seems to make a, to me, it would seem to make a difference in, in what area you're at in the metro area, that you probably have a higher concentration of discounted rates than you do full fare rate. We'd have to look at that to see how much of that analysis we might have available, or how much might we might have to take a take a look at that. Um, I, I, we might have a certain degree of granularity we, that we could look at, but without talking to some team members, I couldn't. couldn't That's say fine. It was just but, a question that came up at the NATO meeting, and I, we just couldn't come up with a reasonable answer. So, since you're here, we'll ask you. All right. We'll put you on the spot, <laughs> and then you can turn around and give it to Bill. <laughs> Uh, Director Stoltzman. 
Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, I have a lot of questions, but I'll just do one for tonight. And you're welcome to come visit me in Louisville. You can take the bus rapid transit past the hole in the highway and come visit me. It'll be perfect. Um, <clears throat> but my, my question for tonight is you started with the, the slides early on where the board had asked for different creative ideas, like sort of everything's on the table. So um, could you tell us a little bit about um, what some of the creative alternatives are and sort of what I'm talking about is, um, you know, you we had the bus rapid transit presentation last month or a couple weeks ago, and um, it, it showed that bus rapid transit would be off operating in existing lanes, and so there was no cost for right-of-way. So did you consider running rail on alternate routes or fixed guideway of some sort on alternate routes uh, that you wouldn't have right-of-way acquisition costs associated with it if you could just partner with municipalities uh, along the way to go a different way or other other alternatives. Now we're talking 2050 and we're still talking heavy rail, which was around, you know, long, long ago. So are there other technologies? Are there other groups now that have entered into the fray? We're having a presentation later on the Front Range Rail. Are there opportunities to partner on some of these other programs? So just could you tell us a little bit about the creative alternatives that you considered? Thank you. So uh, regarding the right-of-way, on some of the corridors, we own the right-of-way already. So I'm thinking uh, the North Line, uh, that we own that on uh, the Southwest Extension. I think we own the lion's share of, of that right-of-way. Uh, the Central Rail Extension, we don't. That would be working with Denver probably on easement. But, you know, there's there's opportunity to be, I think, creative there, um, not just with arrangements with uh, municipalities, but also uh, reviewing the design criteria and seeing what elements we might be. So, for example, a lot of the costs on that project are utility related. Most of them are probably utility and street and sidewalk improvements. So um, are there opportunities for us to maybe lower requirements and take that risk on and, and get the project done? That's uh, something that we could look at as well. There are new technologies coming around every day. In fact, um, we're uh, in conversations with the Burlington Northern Santa Fe now on different kinds of equipment that could possibly run uh, on on the Northwest alignment. And you know, one, although we haven't discussed this in detail, you know, there there is technology. I don't think it's really operating here in the U.S., but uh, I'm aware that it is. I believe operating in Germany, where it's a battery electric. Uh, um, train essentially. So it'd, it'd be very similar to our commuter rail trains that we run now, but they could run on battery for a certain period of time and then connect up to the overhead power system. So on a project, uh, as long as Northwest Rail, if we didn't, there'd be a savings if we didn't have to build that overhead uh, power uh, power supply. So, the, you know, those are a, a variety of uh, of different things. And then, of course, there's a lot around, around the funding. And uh, one of the things I think that we're interested in, and this would take really some movement at the federal and the state level is if we had more flexibility on uh, what we could do with property we acquire, because now we're very limited to we can only acquire property for a specific transit use. And if there's other there's other countries and even some other states that are a little bit more flexible where they, they're able to do a lot more development. And, you know, in, in some locations, these are extreme examples, but like in Japan and in Hong Kong, they're just as much a real estate company as they are a transportation company and about half of their revenue comes in from real estate development and things like that. So, you know, those are pretty, those are pretty far out, but those are just uh, some of the things. And then of course, you know, some of the other items that we've, that we've identified, but we, we haven't taken any of this into modeling and we haven't taken any alternative routes other than the work we've already identified through the modeling yet. Any other questions uh, on the phone? Uh, Director Rex. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dave, thank you, sir, very much for the presentation. I had a question um, with regards to the, the VMT tax. Knowing that you guys really, I mean, you haven't had an opportunity to study any of these in great length, but the whole concept, I would assume, would be in the event that the state were to go away from the fuel tax and to a VMT tax or road users tax, that there would be a portion that would be dedicated to public transportation or something like that, right? It wouldn't... You're not thinking about just doing a separate VMT tax yourselves. I want to just clarify that. That, I would say, is is correct. I, I think most of the opportunity for uh, for RTD, and I think the region, when we talk about transportation funding, which we're all in desperate need of, 
is I think if we work collaboratively and together on, on funding as opposed to individually, I think there's a lot more leverage and a lot more that we can accomplish. Uh, the chair has a question. Uh, I'm looking at the capital cost. Is, is that construction only or does that also include rail cars? The capital cost would include uh, the rolling stock and facilities that we would need to Great. operate. Any other questions? Uh, seeing none, we will um, transition to the next item, a uh, briefing in RT. Is your preamble or? Uh, get your slide up as well. What the heck? Well, again, we have. Uh, RTD General Manager Dave Genova um, uh, presenting on the Reimagine RTD study. Uh, their RTD is beginning uh, a two year study called Reimagine RTD to better understand and forecast uh, current and future public transportation needs in the Denver region. This effort includes considering a comprehensive redesign of its service, programs, and funding to address future needs and enhance customer experience. So once again, let's see here, why is that? We have Dave Genova. Thank you once again. <laughs> it's uh, great to be here for two presentations tonight. And so reimagine RTD. So this uh, was really initiated out of a, a, number, uh, a number of things. And first, in, 20, in 2018, uh, our board of directors uh, every year adopts uh, strategic priorities. They adopt those early in the year for the upcoming year. So in 2018, one of the strategic priorities that the RTD board adopted was to address future transportation needs and methods. And so as we started to embark on what does that really look like and what does that really mean, uh, we started to think about you know, what does the RTD network look like, what are all the other kinds of mobility options and alternatives that are showing up today, different kinds of services, technologies. And so we, we embarked as a team, an RTD team, to respond to this strategic priority as uh, talking about transportation transformation. And so... Uh, the transit industry, I think, over the last couple of years, a lot of questions about um, how does public transit stay relevant with the onset of a lot of different new technologies and new kinds of services and things that aren't really very traditional. So it's making us think very uh, differently and visionarily about what are other kinds of services, technologies, and things that we can bring into our existing family uh, family of services. And so as the regional transportation provider for the Denver Metro region, we want to be the region's mobility integrator. And so last September, uh, we convened a mobility summit around this, around this topic. Some of you may have uh, attended that. I see a few people that actually presented there, uh, and I know others that were there. But that's how we initiated transportation transformation. It was something that uh, we started in about January of 2018, and really we began uh, what, what transportation transformation or what we call T2 uh, with uh, spending an, an hour of very focused time at our senior leadership team meeting. Every, every, we meet every, every Wednesday morning after our board meeting. Uh, and we dedicate just one hour to talk about what does the future of transportation look like? What are the technologies that are coming? Uh, what are the services that are coming? And it's time where we can spend really being intentional and really focused on these opportunities and trying to think about too, not just what's coming, but what's going to be fisc fiscally and practically sustainable. Because I think we've all seen in the last couple of years, we've seen services come and go uh, that have stood up. Uh, several micro transit service providers started up and then they went out of business. We know that uh, other kinds of mobility alternatives are currently not fiscally, uh, fiscally sustainable now. So I think the, one of the big challenges here is for us to think about what are going to be those things that are fiscally sustainable and practical in the short, the near, and the long term. So that's our Transportation Transformation Initiative, or T2, to begin with. And so uh, fast forward into this year, we've kicked off uh, Reimagine RTD, 
And reimagine RTD is really uh, part of, so transportation transformation, if I could give you a, a visual, is kind of our overriding umbrella where we have lots of different inputs going into that. And reimagine RTD is just one of the many things we're doing uh, under the, the T2 work. So around this circle that you see on the slide, I, I will tell you that uh, almost every one of the inputs is a 2020 uh, board adopted a strategic priority for the organization. So those are the board adopted strategic priorities that will be driving uh, Reimagine RTD. So it's gonna be about a two year plan, a two year body of work for us, uh, where we'll be looking at the changing landscape of transportation. Uh, we're going to look at how we do every part of our business, how we deliver bus services, rail services, where are the gaps in the services that are out there now, what are the needs and the demands uh, in, the, in the community, and we'll be working through those. I think I went backwards instead of forwards, sorry. Um, so here we are, I'm on the right slide now. Um, so initially I think we started to think about this as simply looking at uh, what we would call uh, a comprehensive operational analysis or a system optimization plan. A handful of major transit agencies in the U.S. have gone through pretty major what we call system redesigns. And it's uh, something that the industry is starting to look at very seriously because you know, we're, we're constantly kind of changing our service delivery every, every uh, four months. We have a run board or service changes, but we don't often look at picking up the whole system, analyzing the whole system, and then trying to lay back down what would be the best, most efficient uh, system that we can do. So we're gonna take a look at basically everything we do, uh, new technologies, new funding streams, and gaps. So the I think the really uh, a main part of this is we're gonna have a very robust uh, public and stakeholder engagement process. And in fact, we've just begun this process by reaching out and sending out invitations for people to apply for our steering, our advisory steering committee and our technical working group. And the steering committee will be a committee that advises uh, the RTD staff, and then we'll take that uh, information to the board. But that's going to be the, the highest level participation. And some of, the, some of the makeup on that committee that we anticipate, we want to have some elected officials there. So we are working through, we've sent the invitations to all of the uh, county TIP representatives to have, uh, to to come on one one person that would represent each TIP region, and they would be they would be appointed. We've asked uh, Dr. Cog and uh, Mr. Rex that either appoint himself or somebody else from uh, the agency. Also, uh, CDOT. We've asked uh, Shoshana Lou to, to do the same, and then we've reached out to a lot of chambers, community interest groups. Uh, universities and others to invite them to apply. And so that process is, is underway for both the steering advisory committee and the technical working group. And those are just the, really the two biggest groups uh, that we envision that we be getting a lot of input and a lot of analysis being done. But then there's also going to be a very robust, uh, what do we call the stakeholder? You told me an acronym the other day, stakeholder. Uh, stakeholder. Well, I'll, I'll skip the acronym, but um, there'll be a lot of opportunity because we want to get a lot of input. We really want to listen to the community and the stakeholders in terms of what are what are the demands that they see, what are the needs that they have, both in terms of transportation, uh, but then also how they want to do things in terms of in terms of technology. So at the at the end of the day, um, what we what we envision is this will really be the what's next for RTD. It will result in a comprehensive forward-thinking plan that'll better connect people to places they want to go. Uh, this, this is just put in as a reminder, the, the progress map uh, so far really just shows the rail system and the BRT system that is built out today, and it, it also shows the unfinished corridors on there. But, uh, but thinking in, con in, in the concept of Reimagine RTD about really being able to uh, build on the investment we've already made to uh, better serve all of our stakeholders and community. So the schedule, I've explained a little bit about how we've already initiated the stakeholder engagement process. We'll be briefing our board of directors every two months on what we're hearing at the steering committee and what we're learning at the technical working group and what we're hearing from the stakeholder and the public engagement and also our, our employee engagement. 
And at the end of uh, 2020, uh, we are hoping to have a system optimization plan that will be uh, available for our board of directors to hopefully adopt by the end of the year, where we'll be starting to work on uh, how do we uh, make some optimizations to our existing services. And then later in 2021, uh, the big deliverable is the mobility plan of the future for uh, the Denver region. So that completes uh, this presentation and I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions for Mr. Nochenova? Director Partridge. Are we on now? There we are. Thank you again, Dave, appreciate it. You know, uh, certainly it's always good to think every day, and I think you do that right now. It sounds like you meet every, every after every board meeting. I really appreciate that. I do certainly have concern, and, and you know, we've seen this with CDOT. We, we saw the, the kind of reimagined CDOT, and I think they, they've heard a lot of our concerns uh, because of that, because you look at it, a lot of this, the people in this room have been working for years, and when we see things reimagine and uh, rethink, we're going, what have I been doing the last so many years? So I really do have concern, and I also want to bring up, you know, we've, we've invested heavily into the mobility choice blueprint. So it seems like there's a lot of crossover there. So I just, very always attentive to staff, and I would just say we are one of the lowest staff entities in, a, in the metro, whole metro area, the state, by employees to serve. And we take that really highly, and we press that our employees are providing that service. And I would just ask that that same thing be done, because what's being asked is to employees from all jurisdiction to take part in this. And so I just want to be very cautious about the, the amount of extra time put in. And I, I think we already know a lot. So I'm just a little skeptical of it, I'll just have to say. And uh, also as it's brought to us, I think it's, uh, I'm gonna ask for better representation from our sub-region. When you look at it, there's eight sub-regions and that covers the whole metro area. And I think we're only gonna have eight elected officials chosen for our sub-region. I think that's pretty minimal. So David, I don't wanna be a, a negative, but I also, I, I raise that caution and we are paid to ask the questions and that's what I'm asking. Thank you. Uh, thank you, I appreciate the, the input. That's a big part of what we're gonna be doing. So it's important. Great. Director Stolzman. Thank you very much. I, I think there's some skepticism from my community on this, just following on the heels with the same consultant from the uh, bus rapid transit study. Um, just some of the some of the premises that were put into that study and some of the choices that were made in what metrics were used um, dictate a certain outcome. And I just think it's important to remember that we have a diverse geographic area that's represented by RTD and. Um, there are solutions that work in some areas that do not work in others. And so um, I think we're skeptical that this will come out and have um, a, a, a truly open conversation about how to represent the different areas and how to provide different types of services for the different densities of population around the region. Um, there, there was a comment in the previous uh, presentation about uh, fare box revenue. And um, going back to the past program working group and that whole discussion, you know, there was never really, in this is just my opinion, a, a totally open discussion about the elasticity of demand on fare box revenue and truly trying to understand where you can get your maximum return on fare box revenue. And we heard from Mr. Van Meter that, you know, we actually have seen a reduction in participation of riders on some of the routes with this most recent fare increase. So, I, I mean, I have a lot of concerns around this, and I think it's incredibly important that RTD considers not just how to continue to cut services and reduce riderships to make things work. We need to look at how to increase revenue and incre increase participation. Um, and you know, you, each one of these things always has really nice uh, bullets at the onset. I think we should add some verbs to them. So it said ridership. I hope the goal is to increase ridership. Um, you know, we should be really clear that the goal is not to decrease ridership. Um, 
it's one of them had it was there was a nice something with workforce it had a nice positive thing building workforce so that's good but i hope that um, we're improving safety and we're improving fiscal sustainability so i think you know we need to be clear and make sure that we reach these goals they're good goals um, but I'm not sure in the past we've really accomplished the goals that we've set forth. And, and transit is just so important that, you know, it's really important that we get this right. Thank you very much. If I, if I could just uh, say we appreciate that uh, and, and your, your input, it's highly valuable. Uh, I, if I could just address so those those couple of things that you mentioned on uh, like ridership, for example, this, the adopted strategic priority from the board is actually increased ridership. So, so Bill, maybe we need to um, put those on on this slide. So it's actually enhance safety and security, increase uh, ridership, and address transit equity. And you know th those are the you know those are the challenging pieces that you know we have to balance out with our service standards and things. Right? Is how do we how do we increase ridership and how do we address and, and provide service. Uh, throughout the entire district, and uh, that's it's going to be, uh, I think, some you know some good work that we're going to have. But our but our our goal is not to decrease ridership through this or to reduce services. It's it's it, our goal is to serve better. Director Flynn, thank you, thank you, Dave, for the presentation. What when you talk about stakeholder and community engagement, what steps are you taking? to reach the very hard to reach marginalized communities that rely on transit. I just went through a, a planning process in my district and discovered just how difficult it is to reach the uh, the very communities who are most likely to use your uh, the product of your plans. And uh, so I wonder if you've maybe solved that problem and how you plan to go about it. Well, I know it's gonna be components in our, in our uh, public outreach plan. I don't have the detail on the on the top of my head, Councilman, but it is uh, it is challenging to reach all groups. Um, but you know, our uh, we're going to be tasked with doing a very robust outreach. Our board of directors is also. Th this is. I think any time we do anything uh, within our organization within RTD, it's the, the one of the board's major concerns is: Are we reaching everybody, and is everybody able to uh, input equally? Uh, across all the diverse communities that we serve, so it, it's a it's a big priority for our board as well. Exactly. Okay. If you uh, when you get the details, or if you have them, you know, back at the office, it'd be great to share them with uh, with us. Yes. So next is it next month, Bill? By the by the next briefing we have scheduled for our board, we will have our uh, stakeholder engagement plan fully developed. So we'll we'll be able to share it then. Okay. And if but, there's a way that we can help you at the local level, let us know. Absolutely. Thank you. Director Jones. Yeah, thanks, Dave. And I, I want to applaud RTD's efforts to um, think about what the transportation future is. It is going to change, and also to try to do things better. Um, I, I want to be supportive of that. I, I guess I would want, as part of this effort, to also reimagine your partnership with the local communities that you serve. As you know, there's at least several communities that are trying to figure out, um, because we aren't getting all of the transit that we need from RTD, how to do it ourselves or come up with another way to bring transit to our communities. And so what does that future look like? Is RTD going to improve and expand to actually meet those needs? Or are we going to figure out how to um, divvy up the pie so RTD provides for regional needs and, and local communities provide for local or I think there's just room for improvement, integration, and partnership to really think through that because we need to go bigger than what RTD's current financial situation allows. And um, if communities need to, t to take the onus on themselves, we still want to be able to work um, in close partnership with RTD. And we've had some tough conversations over the years around everything from um, you know, what routes are going to be changed or disconnected or um, reduced in service to fare box increases. And it hasn't always felt like we have the streamlined integrated partnership that we need and, and really to provide the full transit needs for the Denver metro area. So I hope that that conversation is a part of this effort as well. Thank you. If I could just respond to two things. In fact, your your first item that you brought up on the local partnerships was something that several of our board members brought up last week. Uh, we had we went through an exercise with our RTD board at a, at a study session last week 
to look at some proposed guiding principles to, that we could give to the, the various work groups uh, to kind of guide, uh, guide the work. And that was a very um, important theme that came up, some feedback we received from the board. So it's on their radar as well. So I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up. Regarding the, the needs and demands, I'm also glad because that, that it stimulated something in my mind that I wanted to talk about and I didn't cover. So RTD traditionally is, you know, we've not gone out and ever developed an unconstrained service plan, meaning, meaning what are the actual needs and demands out there? We always build our service plan on the resources we have available, which are short. Um, I mean, we all know that, uh, I mean, every everybody in this room, right, is looking for transportation funding. We know that we need to do more with transportation, and, and that's no different for, um, for RTD. So one of, the, one of the components that we will build at the end of the day when we uh, develop the mobility plan of the future is we will have a constrained financial plan, meaning here's what we can do with the resources we have available and what we predict we can have available, and here's a plan based on the actual need and demands that are out there. So a lot of agencies have done that. We've not done that, and I think we've done a disservice to ourselves and to our stakeholders because we, uh, we've always been working in the constrained world because we always have to have a, a balanced budget, our, our one-year budget, our six-year budget, and our long-term plan. So you know, I'm, I'm really excited to see what the unconstrained plan is going to look like that's actually going to be based on you know, what, are the, what are the needs. Uh, because you know, that can put us in a situation where we can say yes to questions as opposed to, you know, sorry, we don't have the funding for that. Executive Director Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, Dave and I also, I would like to echo the, uh, an appreciation for your willingness to take on this difficult conversation. And, and it will be difficult, I'm sure, over the next two years. Um, I do have an offer for you with regards to uh, appointments from the subregions. I, I mean, we're willing to help wherever we can in getting that word out to the subregions. I don't know if that's occurred yet or not, but please, Bill, I'm looking at you. If there's anything we can do to really help uh, facilitate that, we're more than more than happy to do it. And the last comment I have is related to the mobility choice that uh, Director Partridge raised. Um, we're we're going to bring back a presentation later on this month uh, associated with uh, mobility choice. But I will say there are definitely some commonalities between mobility choice and some of the stuff that Dave talked about today as part of T2, and that's intentional, right? There's So part of the mobility choice initiative, if you remember, there were 30, 32 tactical actions of which uh, RTD has stepped up to the plate and taken on a number of those related to some of the items that David has up on the screen today. So just so you know that there is some collaboration and coordination there. Thank, thanks for that. Doug, we have sent out the invitations to the representatives for those regions. So okay. if, if you just wanted to remind them, that'd be great. Okay, we will do. Uh, any other questions for Mr. Genova? Seeing none, we thank you. We thank you very much. Uh, next item is a briefing on front range passenger rail. Jacob Rieger, come on down. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Give me one moment. Okay, thank you again. Uh, my name is Jacob Rieger, Dr. Cog's staff. Uh, we wanted to give you a briefing on the activities of the Southwest Chief and Front Range Passenger Rail Commission. You've probably heard bits and pieces in the media over the last couple months or so. So we wanted to come to you, particularly as the commission is kicking off a major uh, planning process regarding Front Range Passenger Rail, um, and we literally just kicked that off. Uh, we wanted to come to you and give you some details about what the commission is up to and what this planning process is going to um, is going to undertake over the next really several months to a couple years. Um, just so you know, I am Dr. Cog's representative on the commission. I happen to be vice chair of the commission, so we are well represented on the commission. But I actually wanted you to hear from today from our rail commission project director, Randy Grauberger. He's the one that's actually doing the hard work. So, Randy? Thank you, Jacob. 
And uh, thank you. I, I think a lot of you have probably heard parts of my presentation. We're in the process of, of updating it now that we've got our consultant team on board. Uh, HDR just received their notice to proceed in the last 10 days. And um, we're, we're anxious to really get on with the project now that a lot of the paperwork is, is behind us. Um, as this uh, first slide suggests, uh, the uh, Southwest Chief and Front Range Passenger Rail Commission was actually created back in 2017. Uh, the legislature uh, passed the, the bill which basically added the Front Range uh, Passenger Rail element to the previous Southwest Chief Commission. Um, the commission is housed under CDOT, uh, but I and, and I am a CDOT employee once again after a few years on the consultant side of the world. Uh, but I don't report to, to CDOT per se. Uh, I have 11 bosses. Uh, Jacob Rieger is one of those. Bill Van Meter in the room is another one. Uh, five are appointed by the governor. Uh, the two class one railroads, both BNSF and UP, are, are members of the commission. And I think that's very important because I think a lot of times when you start a project and try to bring the railroads in uh, toward the end of the project, that might uh, cause some difficulties. But having UP and BNSF both on, on this commission from the start, I think will really benefit this project. We also have some passenger rail advocates uh, that are represented um, and appointed by the governor, uh, as well as all of the MPOs. All four of the Front Range MPOs are members. Uh, North Front Range, Dr. Cog, Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments, and, and the Pueblo MPO are, are all members, as is a representative from the southern counties um, that uh, are served by the Southwest Chief. And lastly, uh, Bill Van Meter uh, represents uh, the RTD on, on the board. We also have three non-voting members, uh, CDOT's David Krutzinger, Division Director for the Division of Transit and Rail. Amtrak is a non-voting member. And then we also have a non-voting member represented by uh, the president of the uh, Wyoming, uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming Chamber of Commerce. This next uh, slide uh, sort of reflects the fact that we haven't identified the specific alignment within the corridor. The legislature said that the study should look at front range passenger rail from Fort Collins to Pueblo. Um, and this map shows that. Uh, we also connect Obviously, through Denver, the, the red line uh, is identified by the California Zephyr, the Amtrak train. The orange line in the southeastern corner of the state represents the Southwest Chief. Um, part of, of the Commission's previous role and continuing role is to continue to ensure that the Amtrak Southwest Chief line remains in Colorado. Uh, a couple of years ago, Amtrak and BNSF were sort of threatening to move the line completely out of the state. Uh, so the Commission and its neighboring partners in Kansas and New Mexico uh, were able to secure some federal grants to uh, upgrade the, the Southwest Chief infra Infrastructure in, in the three states, and we're continuing to do that. Uh, in fact, in this past July, the Commission was a partner with uh, the two other states in, in going after a 2019 build grant from uh, USDOT to finalize all of the improvements to the infrastructure on, on the Southwest tr Chief's trackage. And lastly, uh, and certainly probably the most visible element of our work right now is, is the Commission's uh, charge to development of uh, Front Range Passenger Rail <laughs> Network, again, between Fort Collins and Pueblo. Uh, the consultant team, uh, led by HDR, has, has just been selected, as I said. Carla Perez is here today. Uh, keeping an eye on my presentation, making sure that I'm uh, going to be able to get through this, and, and she's here to answer all the tough questions. Also along, uh, alongside Carla back there is David Singer. David is, is part of the CDOT team. Uh, we're using a blended team. This was Shoshana Liu's idea. She said we've got a lot of resources within CDOT, and, and we can partner with the consultant team, so uh, we've got a lot of the CDOT environmental resources are being used as well as, as CDOT's uh, travel forecasting model. Uh, the statewide travel model was pulled together uh, in conjunction with the MPOs uh, modeling folks over the last couple years. And, and Shoshana Liu indicated that she certainly wanted to take advantage of that. So we've certainly got a blended team between commission staff, CDOT staff, and, and this uh, HDR team, as you can see here. Uh, one of the charges of, of uh, 
of the consultant team is to develop a rail passenger service development plan. This is a requirement from the Federal Railroad Administration um, that says if, if you ever want federal funding, and of course Colorado is going to want federal funding for this project, but if you do that, you need to uh, develop a, a rail passenger service development plan. Uh, that uh, basically selects the alignment, uh, looks at uh, the operating plan, capital plan, cost estimates, ridership, where are the stations going to be? Is this, is this uh, system going to be operating in the right-of-way of the Interstate 25, or are we going to use uh, partnerships with the Class 1 railroads and, and put the passenger service in, in the existing uh, BNSF and UP rights-of-way up and down the Front Range? Um, so uh, this, this project will probably, uh, normally a, a service development plan can take up to 18 months, but we've really got this on a fast track. And uh, the HDR team has projected, uh, you know, completing this much earlier than the normal 18 months. Uh, we're also uh, going to be doing a project level environmental impact statement. Again, this is where David Singer and his folks and, and the uh, other folks on the consultant team on the, on the NEPA side of things uh, will be certainly developing a uh, purpose and need. That's going to be one of the early items of the pre-NEPA activities. Uh, certainly looking at the multiple range of alternatives. And, and CDOT has studied uh, front range passenger rail concepts over the years. Uh, RTD has done that. Uh, we'll be using the, the NAM study, the Northwest Area Mobility Study that was completed a few years ago. Uh, CDOT completed a high speed study back in uh, probably about five or six years ago now looking at 180 mile an hour rail system operating primarily in the I-25 corridor. Uh, up north, CDOT uh, updated the commuter rail element of the North I-25 EIS back in 2014. So there's a lot of, of work that's been done. Uh, the consultant team will not be starting from scratch. Um, we're going to be preparing a draft EIS using a lot of the streamlining techniques that are being talked about now in the one federal decision. We've had good conversations with all three of the federal agencies, FRA, FTA, and FHWA, not sure who the lead agency is going to be. Uh, if, the, if the project winds up putting a lot of the, the railroad within I-25 right away, then FHWA will certainly be a player. Uh, if we utilize the uh, rights of way of the Class 1 railroads, that's really the FRA's jurisdiction. And of course, we'll uh, probably be tapping into uh, RTD's North Metro line coming in from the north end and possibly the Southwest Corridor accessing downtown from, from the southern part of the state. So that would, would bring FTA into the game. And all, all three federal agencies are, are anxious to work with us and, and plan on meeting on a quarterly basis. Stakeholder engagement is, is you guys just talked about it um, through RTD's project and we're certainly just starting to kick that off today. We had a meeting with, with Carla and some other folks today uh, on sort of a subcommittee looking at stakeholder engagement. Uh, we have the, the normal project management team with staff and, and consultant folks uh, meeting biweekly. There'll be a technical working group that we'll pull together uh, once we start um, stakeholder engagement uh, in a serious fashion. The concept is going to be to look at uh, sort of a segment coalition uh, development. We're going to have a southern element to this project, a central element, and then a northern element. Certainly the, the issues in, in Fort Collins and Loveland are a lot different than they are in Colorado Springs and Pueblo, so we think it's, it's appropriate to uh, break the stakeholder engagement out, at least initially, into these three segments. Uh, these first meetings will be taking place probably as early as October. Uh, and then in November, we'll move forward with uh, a corridor stakeholder coalition where we bring elements of all three of those segments uh, together and, and meet as a, as a corridor coalition and start talking about the project uh, as, at the corridor level. Uh, there'll be a project leadership committee. This will start to bring in some of the policy folks from the governor's office and federal agencies, uh, as well as, as elements of the, the previous stakeholder coalitions. And then lastly and importantly, we're going to have to have a railroad roundtable. Again, we've got the Class 1 railroads involved, and we're going to be engaging them individually. Uh, but we believe even maybe some of the short-line railroads might have an opportunity up and down the Front Range corridor to, to play a role in, in this project, uh, even if that's just in the, 
uh, possibility of the, the Omnitrax Great Western Network up north crosses I-25 in several locations, so they might uh, be an ideal location to house a maintenance facility for, uh, for front range passenger rail. We can't do this without uh, working with the legislature, obviously. Um, so the commission and commission staff members are, are starting to talk to some of the CDOT uh, legislative liaison folks about uh, possible uh, legislative options that may go uh, in front of the legislature in this next 20, uh, 20 session. Uh, I don't think we're going to be far enough along in terms of the service development plan to start talking about funding elements quite yet but it would certainly be appropriate to start talking to the legislature about what is this going to look like? What's this uh, front range corridor district going to be? Uh, what will the county makeups be? What municipalities will be in? What won't be in? Uh, some of those kinds of things. Will this be, will the legislature decide they want to create a rail enterprise perhaps to sort of replace the, uh, this commission? Uh, those are questions that uh, we're going to be investigating here very soon and and we'll certainly be uh, talking to the uh, uh, TLRC about actually uh, on the 16th of, of September. Uh, Jacob and, and our chair, uh, Jill Gabler, will be uh, making a presentation to the TLRC uh, and getting them up to speed on, on, uh, on the commission that the legislature itself created a couple years ago. Upcoming activities, the commission meets every, uh, every month, every second Friday. Uh, they have one meeting in Denver, and then the following uh, month, uh, the meeting is somewhere uh, outside of Denver. Uh, when I uh, was interviewed for this position back in December, uh, at that time, the commission was having all their meetings in Denver. And I said, you know, you're called the Front Range Passenger Rail Commission, and you're going to want to get a lot of public support up and down the corridor. So why don't we have every other meeting uh, somewhere outside of of Denver and, and at the next meeting Bill Van Meter made a motion and everybody thought that was a great idea and, and it's worked out really well. We've had meetings in uh, Colorado Springs, Fort Collins and Pueblo. The last meeting uh, last month in Pueblo we had down at the historic Union Depot in Pueblo and 75 members of the public showed up and uh, supported, supported the commission's efforts. So um, that's been pretty exciting. This next meeting is in Denver. I think the October meeting we're looking at possibly being uh, up in Loveland. We do have a, uh, a MetroQuest survey that's been online since the middle of uh, since the middle of July. We're getting a really incredible response to that. Uh, here's a little information. Uh, as of uh, August 22nd, we had over 3,400 responses. That number is now up over 4,000. Uh, but the amazing number to me is that over 90% of the people that are responding to this survey are saying that uh, they support the implementation of front range passenger rail uh, up and down this front range corridor. You know, before the survey ever came out, I was thinking, man, if we can get 70%, that's going to be really, really, you know, a strong indication of support. But over 90%, I think, is, is pretty incredible considering we really haven't started stakeholder engagement on this project yet. That's the end of my presentation today. I'd be glad to take uh, any questions. And again, we've got David Singer here to talk about all the environmental side and our project manager on the consultant team, Carla Perez. And of course, two of my, my bosses, Jacob and Bill, I'm sure would be glad to answer any questions as well. Any questions? Mauer. You're welcome. It's not working. Um, I know your EIS has to go through an approval process. Is, does your the passenger rail service development plan have to be approved as well? Uh, that has to be approved by the FRA. Yes, the Federal Railroad Administration is. It's basically one of their required documents in order to receive federal funding. So they'll be uh, looking over our shoulder and partnering with us, you know, throughout this project as as the service development plan comes together. Any other questions? Seeing none, we thank you. Thank you. No other items on the agenda, we will adjourn. Oh, oh Director Rex. Yeah. Oh, oh, so sorry. Thank you. I'll just talk to myself. I do it all the time anyway. Get all the right answers that way. 
No, um, just just real quick. I, I just want to point out that in our um, so our regular board meeting, which is in two weeks from today, one of the uh, one of the action items that we'll have on there, we're going to have a presentation on Proposition CC, and uh, with the opportunity to take a position on on uh, on that initiative. So I say that because in, uh, attendance will be very important because um, in order to pass or in order to support or oppose any ballot initiative, there needs to be an affirmative vote of the majority of our member representatives. So we have to have 30 vote um, one way or the other in order to, to uh, support or oppose an initiative. So uh, attendance will be critical. Director Jones. Just to put a, a finer point on that, not only do you need to physically show up, you also cannot abstain which frequently, if you're asked to take a vote on something for, our, uh, for Dr. Cog, but your jurisdiction hasn't taken a position, some people abstain. And so in order to actually make a viable choice for the region, which is wearing your Dr. Cog hat, we need you to work through whatever that is so you can show up ready to vote. That's correct. Anything else? No, sir. At 512, we're adjourned. <laughs>